The Allied response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine has been very clear. On the one hand, they have supported Zelensky's government with tons of weapons and money. On the other hand, they have punished Russia with a host of economic sanctions of all kinds. From banning Russian ships and planes from using Western ports and airports, to banning the supply of a whole host of goods of all kinds, we're talking about one of the largest sanctions programs ever undertaken. This is something we've discussed both in the Patreon newsletter and in past videos. The fact is that support for Ukraine has been a success. The Ukrainian government has managed to resist the Russian onslaught and even turn the tables and take the initiative. But what has happened to the second part of the Western response? What is happening with the sanctions on Russia? To what extent have they weakened the Russian economy? Have they been a success or a failure? Well, taking into account all the sanctions, this quickly created an expectation that the Russian economy would collapse and the country would collapse. However, by the end of 2022, the situation looked very different. Yes, it's true that the country went into recession, but it barely lost 2.5%. Even worse, government revenues did not even suffer. In fact, despite all of the sanctions in 2022, Russia's revenues from hydrocarbon exports soared. Check it out. Russia's revenues from oil and gas sales increased by almost a third during the year. By volume, gas exports fell. But Russia exported more oil and more liquefied natural gas than in previous years, and it sold it all at much higher prices. Far from bringing Russia to its knees, it seems that the sanctions made the money flow into Russia as if there were no tomorrow. Financing the war in Ukraine was a piece of cake. At least, that's what the data seemed to indicate. For example, look at what happened in 2022 with the current account balance of the balance of payments, which is where the result of the exchange of goods, services, and investments with foreign countries is measured. As you can see, Russia had a surplus of almost $250 billion, much more than the previous year. In this way, in just a few months, Russia was able to compensate about two thirds of all the foreign reserves of this country that the Western powers had frozen. Do you remember? The G7 has frozen all of Russia's reserve assets in their countries. Indeed, everything indicates that both oil and and gas played a key role in Putin's final decision to invade Ukraine. Why? Well, you see, from the Kremlin's perspective, the enormous European dependence on Russian hydrocarbons would make the Western response very restrained, which is exactly what happened when Crimea was annexed in 2014. And in any case, the very tension of the war would raise the selling price of hydrocarbons, which would allow the Russian government to finance the Ukrainian war without major inconvenience. Let's just say that the war could pay for itself. And in a way, as we've seen, that is what has happened. This is one of the few times in this whole story that the Kremlin's calculations seem to have been correct, at least for now. But how is the Russian economy actually doing? What are its prospects for the future? Is it really immune to Western sanctions? Well, let's take a look. And the first place to start is from the ground up. We need to know exactly where we are. Listen up. The flip side of the Russian accounts. The first thing we have to keep in mind so that they don't pull the wool over our eyes is that we're talking about Russia, which is not exactly the most transparent country, nor does it have the most honest government in the world. In 2022, the Kremlin introduced statistical censorship, a huge amount of data such as international reserves or trade or production metrics became unavailable. Financial reports, including those of private banks, were also restricted. Evidently, no government likes to air data that may not appear positive, let alone a government as authoritarian as Putin's. In addition, the strong capital controls in place in the country have meant that the ruble does not really reflect its market value. And why is this important? Well, because in order to assess the real state of the economy, a market exchange rate is needed. Otherwise, the international value of the GDP and its purchasing power is adulterated. As if that were not enough, military production also contributes positively to GDP, even if it is worthless. For example, if artillery shells are produced, sent to the front, and launched, the shells disappear, but are still included as value added in GDP. And yes, it's true that it's something that has been produced in the year, but it is something that nevertheless does not imply an increase in national wealth. Quite the contrary. And guess what? If there's one thing that is on the rise in Russia, it is precisely military spending. So be on the watch for creatively presented Russian statistics. But okay, I know what many of you are probably thinking. Here we go again. The visual politic people are attacking Russia by questioning this country. Country's data. Well, what can I say? We're talking about Russia. The bad thing would be to not question their data. But do you know what? Even taking the figures for granted, things are not going as well for the Kremlin as many may think. <laughs> 
Firstly, because Russia is a country that has been in decline for years. We're talking about a country of 143 million inhabitants whose GDP is equivalent to that of Italy and whose exports are equal to those of Belgium. And this in spite of all the oil, gas and other natural resources at their disposal. But that's not even all. We're talking about a very old country whose population has been shrinking since the fall of the Soviet Union. So this is a country that's been in crisis for years and whose standard of living has declined over the last decade. But we must also bear in mind that the sanctions had three main objectives. Firstly, to punish Russia's long-term productive capacity in order to limit its resources and condemn it to irrelevance. Secondly, to hamper the war effort and damage the military industry. For example, by preventing them from supplying their troops at the front with modern and effective weapons. And thirdly, to cut Russia's energy and financial ties with the West, and with Europe in particular. Do you know what? Those three objectives have largely been met. Economically, sanctions are punishing Russia. In a future video, we will talk to you about the impact that the war and sanctions are having on trade, industry, the flight of talent, and the Russian central bank's own monetary policy. For the time being, the US government expects the cost to Russian economy of sanctions by 2030 to be at least 20% of GDP. That's a 20% burden on a country that was already in decline. The gap between Russia and Western countries will not stop growing. First objective achieved. From the military point of view, well, what can I tell you? The Russian military industry is losing contracts all over the world and its ability to produce relatively modern things is greatly diminished. In fact, this is what explains things like this. We have reports from the Ukrainians that when they find Russian military equipment, it is full of semiconductors that they took out of dishwashers and refrigerators. Gina Raimondo, US Secretary of Commerce. Indonesia buys US and French fighter jets for $22 billion. The Russian Su-35 lost the game. Indonesia's turnaround from a deal with Russia to new purchase agreements with the US and France highlights the potency of US sanctions. Second objective achieved. And thirdly, whether we are talking about oil or gas, Europe's energy break with Russia is already a fact. Borrell announced the overcoming of the EU's energy dependence on Russia. So you see, international sanctions have not managed to stop the war in Ukraine, nor have they caused the collapse of the Russian economy. But don't be too quick to think that they have been useless. What's more, look at this graph, and then add it to the brain drain, the departure of companies, the flight of capital, and the state of international isolation. Things in Russia, visual politic viewers, are not going well at all. But. You know what? That's not even the worst of it. The worst is what may be yet to come. Pay attention to this statement. With astronomical oil and gas revenues, overall budget revenues increased by only 10% and expenditures by more than 20%. This indicates that the situation with public finances is deteriorating and may become critical during 2023. Nikolai Korzhenevsky, economist, founder of Spare Index. In 2022, the Kremlin obtained record revenues from the sale of hydrocarbons. Despite this, the public accounts have gone into the red. In fact, so much so that the Russian government, for example, has already begun to cut items that until recently were considered strategic. For instance, in 2019, they had projected to invest 56.8 billion rubles by 2024 for the development of artificial intelligence. Now, the numbers have changed. It will be 24.6 billion and the time frame has been extended to 2030. So the question is, what could happen if the oil and gas windfall disappears? Well, pay close attention because that is exactly where Ukraine's allies are now aiming. Listen up. Energy Armageddon for Russia. The Russian government is terribly dependent on oil and gas revenues. Before the war, this sector generated almost 45% of all government revenues, while generating all foreign currency needed to cover imports. So who were they selling to? Well, let's say that Europe was by far their main customer. This region swallowed around 60% of all Russian hydrocarbon exports. The United States was also a major buyer. Now sanctions have turned this market upside down. Over recent months, the United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union, and some other allies have banned or begun to restrict oil and gas imports from Russia. But of course, the most forceful measure came in December 2022, specifically on the 5th. On that day, the Russian oil price cap came into force, the latest mechanism devised by Ukraine's allies to hit Russia exactly where it hurts. These countries have stopped or are stopping buying Russian oil, and they barely buy gas anymore either. But that has not been enough. With the cap on the price of Russian oil, any Western company that provides services in an operation related to the sale of Russian crude oil is prohibited from buying above the cap price. For now, it's $60 per barrel. We're talking about services of all kinds, from transportation to insurance to financing of purchases. 
Furthermore, at the beginning of February, this measure will be extended to refined products, that is diesel and gasoline. So the question is, how are these measures working? Well, let's take a look. The EU oil ban and oil price cap have finally kicked in and the impact is as significant as expected. Lauri Milivita, CREA Senior Analyst. The fact that Western countries are stopping buying oil and gas from Russia has caused Russia to look desperately to other markets, such as China or India. The problem is that getting oil and gas to these countries is more expensive than supplying Europe, and then there are the sanctions. To cover themselves, Chinese and Indian buyers, among others, are demanding huge discounts from Russia. Specifically, since the oil price cap came into effect, Ural's crude, Russia's benchmark crude oil, is selling at around $50 a barrel, as if that were not enough. Purchases from these countries are not even close to compensating for the loss of the European market. According to calculations by the Center for Energy and Clean Air Research, a Helsinki-based think tank, Russia could lose $280 million a day in 2023 as a result of the price of crude oil and its derivatives. And keep in mind that we are not talking about an unlikely future. Russia is already losing $172 million every day. That means that in annual terms, the losses for Russia may be around $100 billion. In this table from Russia's own Ministry of Finance, you can see how government revenues evolve approximately under different production and price scenarios. It is true that in the past, oil has already traded at prices of $50 and even $40 a barrel, and Russia has weathered it. The problem is that today, there are two big differences. On the one hand, when this situation arose in the past, the government cut public spending. The problem is that the current war in Ukraine is forcing spending to be increased at the same time that non-oil revenues are also falling sharply. And secondly, now, because of the sanctions, Russia is going to sell much less abroad. So watch out for this kind of trap that Moscow is getting into. What's more, we're not only talking about oil, the same goes for gas. But do you want official data? Well, in terms of volume, for example, Gazprom's international gas sales fell by 46% in 2022. The company compensated for this drop with higher prices, but of course, if we take into account the new gas prices, the budget hole for Russia must be more than considerable. Russia is still in energy power, but its role has changed dramatically. Russia will have a smaller market share in oil and gas, will make less profit, and has also lost some of its geopolitical leverage. Vladimir Milov, former Russian deputy energy minister. And so, visual politic viewers, the sanctions may not have collapsed the Russian economy, but they have served very important purposes that will cause a lot of damage to Russia for years to come. Moreover, the latest oil sanctions may lead to a much more complicated economic scenario for both Russia and the Kremlin itself. Putin has achieved a personal goal though, to go down in history as one of the Russian leaders who destroyed the most wealth in the shortest amount of time. As if that were not enough, voices have now begun to emerge in Russia in favor of a return to central planning and state control. It sounds bad to say it, but in Washington, they are rubbing their hands together. Russia is losing in the military field, in the energy field, and may also end up losing in the economic field as well. But having said that, it's now your turn. Do you think Russia will be able to withstand the new sanctions? What do you think the Kremlin will do to weather the storm? Will it be enough to make them willing to end the war in Ukraine? What is missing? Leave us your impressions in the comments and let's open up a debate. If you found the video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. Thank you so very much for being there. All the best. I'll see you next time.